Today is Sanctity of Life Sunday. It's a day all across this country where the value of life, the sacredness of life, the sanctity of life is brought awareness to and, uh, and we recognize that value that's inerrant in each and every one of us, but especially in the unborn. And I'm going to do my best to be able to tie that thought into this series of messages that I'm doing on finding your purpose in life. Last week, we talked about our purpose as a church, which was to help people find freedom through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I share with why I believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and why freedom and life is found in Christ. Uh, today, I'm going to talk to you about your purpose, and I'm going to go a little roundabout way to get there, but I'm going to talk to you about your purpose. Next week, we're going to talk about God's purpose. But today, I want to talk to you about your purpose, and, and I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to kind of do this in two parts. The first part, I'm going to tie into the value and the sanctity and the, the beauty of life, and then tie that into our purpose, because you really can't separate the two, but I'm going to be really, really scripture heavy in the first part. The good news is, all of it's available on your Freedom Church app. You can download the Freedom Church app, and all the sermon notes are right there, so as I'm blowing through these scriptures then uh, you can have it to email it to yourself. But it, this is also going to be very helpful for especially our students who may feel maybe unequipped to be able to defend a position of life in the culture that we live in today or every individual. This is going to be helpful, but it's going to be necessary for us to understand our purpose to first understand the hand of God in our very creation. You're here today because God created you, designed you, formed you, fashioned you. So let's get right into this. Uh, what, what's your purpose? You can't understand or comprehend your purpose in life by starting with you. It's essential that you start with God. You have to start with God. You can't start. It's, it's like if we were out hiking in the mountains and we got lost and we came across some hikers and we said, hey, how can I get to you know, a certain destination. They say, well, you can't get there from this side of the mountain. You gotta go to the other side of the mountain to get there. It's kind of like that in life. You can't understand or comprehend your purpose in life by starting with you. It's essential that you start with God. So I wanna share with you how understanding the value of life, the sanctity of life is essential for understanding your purpose in life. Are you ready? Are you ready? All right. Jeremiah 1.5 tells us this. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. Psalms 139. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Job 10 says, your hands shaped me and made me. Did you not clothe me with skin and flesh and knit me together with bones and sinews? You gave me life. And then at conception, Isaiah 44 says, this is what the Lord says, he who made you, who formed you in the womb, Job 31, did not he who made me in the womb make them? Did not the same one form us both within our mothers? See, it's very clear throughout the scriptures that God's hand was in our very creation. We're made, created, designed, formed, and fashioned by the hand of God. In fact, it's like the captain who was on the ship and was sailing through the night and saw some lights in the faint distance and issued a command uh, to alter your course 10 degrees south, and he quickly got a response back. Alter your course 10 degrees north. I kind of ticked off the captain, so he sent another message. Alter your course 10 degrees south, I'm the captain. He got a response back. Alter your course 10 degrees north, I'm Seaman Third Class Jones. Well, sending a message now that he knew that would invoke fear, he said, alter your course 10 degrees south. I'm a battleship. He quickly got a response back. Alter your course 10 degrees south. I'm a lighthouse. <laughs> <laughs> now listen, my message today is intended to help you answer probably the most important question in life, and that is what was God thinking when he created us? What was his plan when he created us? Why did he put us on this earth? Because when you discover the answer to that question, then you can understand your purpose for living. And when you understand your purpose, then you're going to hear God's voice saying, alter your course 10 degrees. Stop. Wait. Be patient. Slow down. Turn left. Turn right. 
When you understand your purpose, then you start hearing God's voice giving you direction in life. Because understanding your purpose in life, it's more important than your job. It's more critical than your financial portfolio. It's more significant than your dreams and your goals in life. And if you fail to understand God's purpose in your life, you're going to live in a constant state of dissatisfaction and confusion. Now, we live in a world today that's filled with how-tos and self-help books, and those are all great, and that, that's fine, but all that does is kind of compound the problem of not starting in the right place. They tell you how to be the best version of you, how to find you, how to be you, and that's all great, but if you don't understand the beginning, which it all starts with God, then you're never going to really find your real purpose. You see, people who don't value God's hand in their life will never understand God's purpose in their life. If you don't understand God's value in your life, you'll never understand God's purpose in your life. People who don't value life, they try to dehumanize, especially the unborn, by just calling it lumps of tissue or products of conception. But biblically and biologically, every single one of us are a unique human being even before we are conceived. Because we're created in the mind and the heart of God first, then he forms and fashions us. Even scripture and science tells us that the product of conception is a baby. Genesis 25, 22 says the babies jostled each other within her, speaking of Jacob and Esau, who were twin brothers. Luke 1, when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb. And because man is made in God's image, we know that we have value, we have purpose. Even Psalms 127.3 says that children are a gift from God. And he calls our children his children. Because in Ezekiel 16.20, he said, you took your sons and daughters whom you bore to me and sacrificed them. You slaughtered my children. God calls our children his children. So taking innocent life is nothing short of murder. In fact, Job 12.10 says this, in his hand is the life of every living thing and the breath of every human being. I want to slow down on this verse because I want you to get this. In his hand is the life of every living thing and the breath of every human being. We should not be responsible for taking something out of the hand of God. And that's what abortion is. It's taking life out of the hand of God who says, in my hand is life and every living, breathing thing. God, the giver of life, he commands us not to take innocent life. Jeremiah 7 says, do not shed innocent blood. He warns us in Deuteronomy 7, cursed is the man who accepts a bribe to kill an innocent person. And even on, in the sixth commandment, God wrote with his very finger on the tablets of stone, thou shalt not murder, Exodus 20, 13. So it's, it's undeniable that the baby is alive and growing and taking its life is clearly murder. In fact, Jeremiah points out this. He said, he did not kill me in the womb with my mother as my grave. And God vows to punish those who in Amos 1.13 ripped open the woman with child. In fact, in ancient Israel, the unborn child was given equal protection under the law. If it lost its life, he or she lost their life then the one who caused its life would be taken. Exodus 21, 22. If men who are fighting hit a pregnant woman, she gives birth prematurely, there's no serious injury, the offender must be fined. But if there's serious injury, you're to take life for a life. Isn't it interesting that a woman carrying a child today, if somebody murders a mother with a child, can be charged with double homicide, but that same woman can take that child to an abortion clinic and take its life and be praised. That doesn't make any sense to me. Now, in this argument, this debate in our country over pro-life versus pro-choice, God clearly tells us that the only acceptable choice is found in Deuteronomy 30, verse number 19. He said, I've set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live. Now, I know this. God wants every single one of us to be everything that he created us to be. But until you understand that God's hand is upon your life, even before conception, but certainly at conception and throughout your life, you'll never understand that your purpose is found in the hand of God upon your life. 
Life will never make sense to you when you try to separate the two. In fact, Isaiah 44 says this, I'm your creator. You were in my care even before you were born. In the care of God, we don't have the right to take over that care and take it out of the hand of God. So you were born by his purpose and for his purpose. In the search for purpose of life, I know it's puzzled people for thousands of years, and that's because typically people begin at the wrong starting point. They start with us, with me. What do I want? What makes me feel better? What's comfortable for me? What are my convictions? Rather than what does God say? Because here's the, the newsflash. It all starts with God. It's not about me. It's not about you. It all starts with God. Can somebody say amen? In fact, Proverbs eleven twenty eight 28 says this. A life devoted to things is a dead life, a stump, but a God-shaped life is a flourishing tree. Now, I know our world is filled with tons of motivational speakers and all kinds of positive ways of looking at life, and they'll tell you to think big, be a risk taker, be positive, run with the stallions, achieve your dreams, all that stuff, and that's all great. I believe in all of that. But you can do all of that and still be empty, still be crippled, and still be frustrated in your life if you haven't committed yourself to understanding God's purpose for your life because everything begins with God. So I want to share with you five purposes for living. And I want you to find your purpose in these five purposes of living that we'll see in the scripture. And I encourage you, if you've never read Rick Warren's book, Purpose Driven Life, read it, find it, bring it clarity to all I'm sharing with you. But here, number one, you are planned to bring him pleasure. Five purposes for living. You are planned to bring him pleasure. The Bible tells us in Isaiah 61, three, for God planted them like strong and graceful oaks for his own pleasure. So God's first purpose for man is to experience his pleasure. And we do that through worship. But listen to me. Worship is not just the first 20 minutes of our services. Worship should be in everything. Worship should be found in everything. And listen, I'm not saying that you got to walk around singing our worship songs everywhere to create worship wherever you go. The Bible tells us, in fact, look at this next scripture, 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Whether you eat or drink, whatever you do. Somebody say whatever you do. Whatever you do. do it all for the glory of God. Yeah. Now that word glory literally is the Greek word for weight or the Hebrew word for weight, the weight of the glory of God. It's what we feel when you enter into the presence of God. You feel the weightiness, the glory of God. You mean this scripture is saying that we can experience that glory, that weight, that presence of God in whatever we do? Yes, if we're doing it to the glory of God. If we're doing it to his glory, that means that when we're at work, we can bring glory to God. That's worship. When we're at play, we can bring glory to God. That's worship. When we're at doing your hobbies, you can bring glory to God. But we got to make sure that whatever we're doing, we're doing it for the glory of God. So ask yourself, am I bringing glory to God? I told you my word for this year is purpose. Everything I do is going to be uh, on purpose and have a purpose. I want whatever I do to bring glory to God. Number two, you were formed to be in his family. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that's what we are, being formed for God's family, that includes relationship and fellowship. Now, the Bible teaches us in Acts 2.46 that the rhythm of the body of Christ, the rhythm of the child of God, should flow from corporate worship, from the crowd, into community, into fellowship. Uh, it says they continued in the temple courts and then to break bread in the homes. That's kind of the flow, the rhythm of the child of God. We come together and here and we worship together. And there are things that we experience here in worship. As I mentioned last week, there's power and excitement that we experience here together that you don't necessarily get by yourself. But let's be honest. Relationships break down in a crowd. You don't really get to build strong relationships in the crowd. The crowd is one part of our worship. But you want to build relationship, then you need small. Small is better. Worship Packed house is better. Relationship, conversation, getting to know people, small is better. So our rhythm should be flowing from this house of worship into smaller groups, with whether it's classes or home groups or a service group, a ministry group, finding a place where you can 
get to know one another, and one another can get to know you. In fact, the Bible gives us about 50 different scriptures that have one another in it. Here's just a sampling of them. The Bible says that we are to bear one another's burden. We are to be kind to one another, exhort one another, by love serve one another, forgiving one another. In other words, we can't fulfill those scriptures without the other. So it's clear that we're intended to be in life. We're intended to do life together because these scriptures can't be fulfilled without us having relationship with somebody. So what's our purpose? Our purpose, one, is worship. We're created to bring pleasure to him, but it's also relationship. We are created to be in the body of Christ as brothers and sisters. Now, back when the church I grew up in, we called everybody brother and sister so-and-so. How many of you grew up in a church like that? You don't do that that much anymore, but I didn't really know any better. And I remember driving up into our driveway in our alley when I was, I don't know, I was probably 10, 11, 12, and I saw our neighbor get out, and without thinking, I just said, hey, Brother Richard, how you doing? My brother poked me and said, he's not a brother. And I thought, well, what? I, just, I thought everybody was brother this and sister that. I didn't know they had to belong to my church for me to call them that. The fact is we are brothers and we're sisters. We belong together in this family. Now, here's the third purpose for living. You were created to be like Jesus. God wants us to grow like Christ in everything. Now, there's a difference between growing old and growing up, right? There's a lot of people growing old that aren't growing up. They're all in another service. Don't, don't worry, okay? The fact is... While we're growing old, we have a responsibility to grow up. Paul said, man, when I was a child, I, I thought like a child. I spoke like a child. I acted like a child. But when I got older, I put those things behind me. I started growing up. And as followers of Christ, as believers in Jesus, it's our responsibility to grow up. In other words, it's important that we cultivate positive habits, habits of prayer, habits of worship, habits of reading the Bible, habits of faithful church attendance, habits of giving, because if you don't cultivate positive habits, you will create bad habits. It'll happen. You have to be intentional about creating positive habits in your life. So yeah, we were created to bring pleasure to God through worship. We were designed to be able to be in relationship with one another in the body of Christ in small groups. We were also created to be like Jesus. That's discipleship, growing up and becoming more like him. But then number four, you were shaped for serving God. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And I'll just cast this little net out here right now. Easter's coming up soon. It's going to be here before you know it. And it's the biggest weekend of our year. And we always need several hundred extra volunteers every Easter weekend to be able to pull off our Monday, Thursday meal covenant, our Good Friday service, our Saturday morning brunch, and outreach out on the field to the Saturday night service that we'll add that weekend to our Easter sunrise service and all the service. It takes a lot of people to make it all happen. You start planning on how you're going to serve. Because I want everybody doing something. You can attend one, you can serve the other. I just every, It's going to take all of us to make it happen. So you were planned to bring him pleasure. You were formed for his family. You were created to be like Jesus. You were shaped for serving God. You have something to offer the body of Christ. And then here's the last thing as the worship team comes back. You were made for mission. You were made for mission. In John 17, listen to the words of Jesus. He said this, he said, in the same way that you gave me a mission in the world, I give them a mission in the world. Jesus is talking about his father. God the Father gave Jesus a mission in this world. What did he do? He came to draw people to himself so they could have a relationship with God. And he said, I give you the same mission. So what's our mission? To lead people to Christ. Our job is to lead people to Christ. I had an opportunity this week uh, Robin Campbell and Gerald Cartwright gave me an opportunity to be able to meet somebody. The first time I met Josh Huffman, who uh, used to attend Christian Life Cathedral way back in the day. And when I met him, one of the first things he told me was, I led Ron Nelson to the Lord. I asked Ron this morning, I said, did Josh Huffman lead you to the Lord? He said, well, he helped me come back to the Lord. 
But he was so excited, 34 years ago, he had a part in getting Ron back to the Lord and invited him to church. And then Ron brought his wife, Nancy. Nancy came, and about a week or two later, Mary Warwick, who's sitting right back there, led Nancy to the Lord. And they're both all here in church still. And Josh was so excited about having a part in leading somebody to Christ. Now I thought, here's a businessman. He's not called in the ministry. He's called to do business. But he has a passion about leading people to Christ. And I thought, that's the way every single one of us should live our lives. You do your job so you can meet somebody. Because on a job is where Josh and Ron met. But it was on that job where Josh was able to lead Ron back to Christ. And here's what every single one of us need to realize. There's a mission for each of us. So my question for you is not just where are you going to serve on Easter weekend, who are you going to invite Easter weekend? In fact, better than that, who are you going to invite next Sunday? Why do we got to wait till Easter? We're having church next week. Get somebody here that needs to hear about Jesus. Tell It's our mission. That's what we're here for, to lead people to Christ. In fact, look at this passage of Scripture. I'm going to close with this. Luke 23, 39, uh, 9 through 43. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said? Since you are under the same sentence, we're punished justly, for we're getting what our de deeds deserved. But this man had done nothing wrong. And then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth today. You'll be with me in paradise. Why was Jesus hanging there on that cross in between two thieves? To die for your sins and mine, yes. But you know what? It was a picture. It was a picture that God wanted every one of us to see. That still is branded upon my mind as Jesus hangs there in the balance between two men. All three men die a painful, humiliating death. But what a different outcome for each one of them. One says, if you're the son of God, get us down from here. The other thief looked at him and said, man, don't you, don't you fear God? Don't you realize what you're saying? This is the Messiah. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus looked at him, and I want you to get this. Jesus looked at him and said, today you'll be with me in paradise. You know what? That thief that said, remember me, he didn't have a day to serve Christ. He wasn't going to go win anybody to the Lord. He wasn't going to go start a ministry and feed the homeless. He didn't have an opportunity to build up a, a list of good deeds done to be able to get into heaven. He didn't have time for that. And that didn't matter to Jesus. It didn't keep Jesus from saying, this day you'll be with me in paradise. It didn't stop Jesus from granting him eternal life because you don't get saved by the deeds that you do. You get saved because the grace of our God, having faith in what Jesus did for you. Now, when Jesus saves you, that should make you want to do everything you can for him. But your deeds aren't going to get you into heaven. He cried out and said, remember me. And Jesus said, this day you'll be with me in paradise. In fact, Rembrandt painted this moment in a painting called Three Crosses. As Jesus hangs on the cross and the thieves on either side and the picture of the crowd there and many who are walking away and scattering. What a different outcome for each one. In fact, those three crosses, they represent three different things. The cross of rebellion, where one man died in his sin because he refused to accept Jesus. The cross of reconciliation, where one man died to his sins and accepted Christ. And the third cross, the cross of redemption, where one man died for our sins. And John 1, 12 says, Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he became the... He became he gave the right to become children of God. In that moment, when one chose to accept Christ, he was granted eternal life. 
when one rejected Jesus, he faced eternal death. Your choice today is Jesus. He's the best choice you'll ever make. He's the best thing that's ever happened in my life. He's the one who gives us a reason to live. He's the one who helps us find our purpose because he had his hand in your creation from the very beginning and his hand is still upon your life today. And the only way you find your purpose is being in right relationship with Jesus Christ. Choose life today. Do me a favor, stand to your feet all over this house today. There are some in this room today with your heads bowed all over this place. There are some in this room today that you've walked in this place and you're like the thief. You've been shaking your fist at God and saying, God, if you're really God, then you'll fix this problem I'm facing. You'll deal with this issue that I'm battling with. You'll change these circumstances rather than humbling yourself before God and saying, I recognize who you are. I may not understand everything that's going on, but God, I trust you. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. We're all hanging on the same cross today, but your attitude towards the one who hangs in the middle determines your eternal destiny. Will you trust him today? Will you put your hope in him today? If you will trust him today, he's gonna change your life. You'll find real purpose, real meaning, a real joy of life. All over this room today, from the front to the back and the left to the right, there's some of you here today, maybe things just haven't been so clear about your purpose in life, but you realize you've been trying to find your purpose starting with you, but you realize today you must start with God. It starts with being surrendered to the one who created you and made you. Your purpose is found in total surrender to Jesus Christ. And I wanna pray for you today. Those all over this room that say, Kendall, I realize I've disconnected myself from the one who created me. I've disconnected myself from the one who's had me in his care my entire life. I've pulled myself away from the one who gave me purpose and meaning. And I've tried to find purpose in myself rather than through Christ. Today I'm ready to surrender my life to Christ once and for all. All over this room, you say, Kendall, that's me. I'm ready to surrender to Christ, whether this is your very first time or whether you're coming back to Christ. You say, today I'm ready to make Jesus the Lord of my life and surrender to him once and for all so I can find my purpose in life. On the count of three, I want you to slip up your hand. I want to pray for you right there where you are, but I want to pray for you. you say, that's me. Include me in prayer. One, two, three. Slip up your hand right now. Say, that's me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, yes, thank you. Anybody else, just slip up your hand. I want to pray for you. Thank you. Thank you. God sees each and every hand and knows exactly who you are, your name, what you're going through, what you're facing today. And the good news is he's come to you today to help you find purpose and meaning in life, starting with Jesus and starting with surrender. I want us to pray this prayer and this is going to be very simple, but Jesus did not make new life very difficult. He said, if we confess with our mouth and we believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead, then whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But you've got to say it with your mouth and you've got to mean it in your heart. So I'm going to ask everyone to pray so no one prays alone. But those of you that raised your hand, would you pray this out from the depths of your soul, loud and strong, and everybody say, Dear Heavenly Father, Thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross for me. Come into my heart, wash away my sin, and be the Lord of my life today and every day. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, now give him some praise. Oh, come on, sing it out, everybody.
I just want somebody to know today that he's never failed you. He's never forgotten you. He's never left you. You've been in his care your entire life. Now, there's been some circumstances in your life and some situations that you've gone through that's made you question whether God still had his eye on you. You wondered what was going on. Has, had he left you alone? He's never forgotten you. He's never left you alone. He's never given up on you. I want the Williams to know he's never forgotten you. He's never given up on you. As tough as life gets, he's never given up on you. God's got a purpose. We've got to trust him for purpose. Regardless of what you may have gone through and regardless of what you may have encountered in life, God has always been there. Sometimes it takes the dust to settle for us to see God's hand at work in our life. And sometimes while the enemy is coming at you, the dust is, and everything's so stirred up, you can't see. But when it all settles, you're going to see God's been there. He's been faithful and he's been watching you and he's got a plan for you. He loves you more than you could ever imagine. Can I get an amen? He loves you today. Father, I want to, I want to pray a special prayer over those who have felt abandoned who have felt alone, who have felt even neglected is the word that some have used. And I pray that they would understand that God could never abandon, could never neglect, could never give up. It's against his nature. May they see your hand at work in their life today. May they know how much you loved them. And I ask this in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Listen, if you made a decision to follow Christ today, I'm gonna ask you to do something, something very important. As soon as we dismiss this service, I'm gonna ask you to make your way over to the I've Decided wall. And as you make your way over there, I want you to sign that wall, date it, saying today I decided to follow Jesus. It's important that you do that, that you make that declaration. If you need a Bible, we have Bibles we'll give to you. We have a, a booklet titled, Now What? It'll help you with your next step in following Christ. I encourage you to pick that up. If you want somebody to pray with you, we have prayer partners. We'll be happy to pray with you as well. But don't leave here without getting over there, picking up the free book, signing that wall saying, today I decided to follow Jesus. And this is what I believe. I believe that God's going to start stretching some of us and pushing us out of our comfort zone to make us conform to this new purposeful life of living our life in a way that glory glorifies God in all that we do. So get ready for him to start pushing you out of your comfort zone so that everything you do glorifies him. There's some of you need to stop doing some things and start doing some other things to start glorifying him. Get ready to start walking that new path this week. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and give you great, great peace. I love you guys. Have a blessed week, everybody.